Now, if we look at the various different sects uh, in light of the hadith that we just looked at, the Prophet Sallallahu said that this ummah will um, separate into 73 sects. Now, what are these 73 sects? Have there, has there been anybody who's actually listed all of them, who's done a study of history and listed all of them? Absolutely, it's happened many times. In fact, they did this as earlier on as uh, the 4th and 5th century. In fact, I would consider the 5th century, 400 and something, to be one of the, the, the years of the greatest development. Some say that a lot of the sectarian stuff came up when, uh, during, uh, when the conquest of Islam uh, stopped, uh, when the conquest by the Muslims stopped and people were lazy, they decided to take on different uh, ideologies, they decided to bicker between them. And this gave rise to much of this ideological dissension that we see. Uh, Allah knows best. That is, uh, if we look at the various sectarians, you have Abdul Qahir al-Baghdadi, Shahrastani, and uh, others who've tried to list the 73 sects. Now, from what we studied, we've seen about five, six, seven, eight, nine sects. But the thing is that if you look at the Mu'tazilites, they divided into about ten different sects and uh, very different from each other. The, the thing that united them all were maybe some of the five principles, rational approach to things. But it got to such a level that some of them even considered other sects within the Mu'tazilites to be kafir, to be out of the fold of Islam. That's how serious it became even between them. If you look at the Shiites, you have everything from people who considered Ali radiallahu an God, Allah, and when he had some of these people burnt, that reinforced their faith. Because they said, only Allah can punish with, the, with fire, and thus you must be Allah. So you had people at that extreme, and then others who said that he was the rightful prophet, and then others said he was the rightful first khalif, to the level of those who have minor tashayyu, as they call it, which is that they just prefer Ali radiallahu over Uthman radiallahu They believe that Uthman radiallahu is the rightful third khalif and Ali radiallahu is the fourth khalif. But in terms of personal virtue, Ali radiallahu is superior to Uthman. Whereas the Ahlul Sunnah Jaman, the majority opinion there is that Uthman radiallahu has greater virtue than Ali radiallahu Though individually speaking, uh, though individually speaking in terms of individual virtue, Ali radiallahu may have a virtue like bravery which was more than Abu Bakr radiallahu's virtue of bravery. Likewise, Uthman radiallahu may have a level of haya which may be higher than the level of Umar radiallahu in that regard. But collectively speaking, in terms of collective virtue, Abu Bakr is the most superior, followed by Umar, followed by Uthman, followed by Ali radiallahu anhum ajma'een. Shaykh Khalil Ahmed Saharan Puri in his commentary on this hadith in Abu Dawood, he says a very interesting thing, which really sums up, because you're talking about Abdul Qahir al-Baghdadi from, Baghdadi from the 5th century, Ibn Hazm in his Muhalla from earlier, who's writing about the 73 sects. After that, so many sects have appeared, and so many probably will continue to appear until the hereafter. So if you were to record every single small, large, great sect you'd probably come up with hundreds. So what does this hadith mean? The thing is that whenever somebody makes a statement, they have a criteria in mind. There's a certain criteria in mind. When the Prophet ﷺ said this, there must have been some criteria in mind. Nobody asked him exactly, nobody asked him, how big will this sect be? Or each of these sects, how strong will they be? How powerful? How long will they endure for? Nobody really asked him. So now it's a matter of ijtihad to determine exactly who these 73 sects are that were referred to by the Prophet ﷺ. Clearly, there is an overarching message in this, that sectarianism is wrong, and the only saved sect will be the one that is on the path of my sunnah and that of my companions. So what Mawla Khalil Ahmad Saharan Puri says is that the Prophet ﷺ had a proper criteria in mind of a certain kind of sect that would have a certain kind of influence, a certain number of uh, 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 amount of following, and 
Only Allah knows exactly what that refers to, but we can say for sure based on this hadith that there will be 73 such sects of a quantifiable nature as that. But if you count every single variant ideology, then clearly they will, list, they will move into hundreds. So I think we'll have to leave it at that. And we just have to try to stick to that which is the sunnah and the jama'ah. That's where this name Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah formed. So it's based on the hadith. So it's not an innovation. But that's what it is, Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And today the fight is that who is the Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah? Everybody's fighting to be in the Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Can you consider these sects to be kafir? This is a discussion that we'll have more in detail when it comes to the issue of takfir. But in general, it's very difficult to consider all innovators in ideology. This is a, a new concept in the sense that we normally understand innovation in action, in deeds, innovation in practices. But there is also an innovation in Aqidah. And such innovation, until it doesn't lead to kufr, is an innovation, is an abhorrent, reprehensible innovation. That's why you don't see that the majority of ulama considered, for example, all the Shiites to be kafir. Those who were extreme among them that led to kufri beliefs, or that held kufri beliefs, they were clearly labeled kafir. Those of the Mu'tazilites, the ulama of the Mawara un nahr Transoxiana, they considered, a group of them considered the Mu'tazilites kafir. That's because the Mu'tazilites of that area considered human to be absolutely independent in his actions, which was highly abhorrent opinion, which means taking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of the picture there. Whereas others may have not reached that level of innovation, of of. Uh, of uh, ideological divergence and thus they were just innovators that's why there's not a no blanket fatwa from the majority of scholars of any given time that all Mu'tazilites were kafir despite all of these strange opinions of this because it's very dangerous to do kufr to do takfir of somebody so that's something we'll cover more in detail in the takfir section but this is just to put us put, put things in perspective if you're ever asked about a particular group Unless that group has been known to have a clear, explicit belief that is absolute disbelief, and the ulama have agreed to that. For example, the Qadianis, that's a fatwa that's given by everybody. Then unless it's a group like that which is clearly out of the fold of Islam, you would rather say that if somebody holds this belief, for example, if somebody holds the belief that swearing at the Sahaba is permissible, then that's kufr. So that is the way the ulama normally responded. If anybody believes that Allah has human form, then that's kufr. Right? That's kufr. If anybody believes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not know the particulars of things, he only knows the universals of things, that's kufr. So you'd rather give an answer on the actual kufri belief rather than condemn an entire group unless an entire group has been absolutely known to hold a explicit belief.